Hello and welcome to EE 233. I'm your instructor, Gregory Myers. This video, we're going to take a look at some more functions as part of a larger series of our fundamentals and fundamentals demos. And to begin with, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some of the arithmetic operators in C. Now, this video assumes that you have a working development environment, as well as having gone through cre the creation of a couple of functions, including understanding the necessity to have the function prototype listed at the top of your C file, followed by a semicolon, as well as the implementation then later on, where you replace the semicolon with some curly braces and then you put your code inside. The other assumption that is made in this video is that you have access to some of the code snips uh, associated with the demos that we're going to be doing. In particular, we're going to start off with the arithmetic operations or arithmetic operators. And I will leave this up here for just a second, just in case that you don't actually have a copy of it so that you can go ahead and take an opportunity to insert or uh, start with the code that we need here. Um, so there is the body of the function. Let me go ahead and give you a little screen there as much of I, as I can. And then we have the function prototype up top. What we're going to do today is we're going to focus on how do you bring in code that someone else has written into your C file. And so maybe uh, maybe you've, a colleague of yours has given you uh, some source code. Um, we're going to take a look at one way in which you can include it into your project. There actually turns out to be a few different ways that we can go about doing this, but we're going to do the the simplest or the most straightforward way to begin with, and that is to simply we're going to copy the code into our source file. So uh, if you notice, we have a fundamentals.c, which is part of our fundamentals demo. And then I have this arithmetic operators.c file. And what we're going to do is we're simply just going to uh, begin by copying and pasting the function prototype using either the right click menu or the hotkeys, and we're going to add it to our list of function prototypes. And uh, before we go any further, note that this function has a, a void input argument and a void return argument. So basically, this function accepts no input and returns no output, which is perfectly fine for this demonstration. The second thing that you want to do is to go ahead and copy all of the code, including the comments, into your fundamentals.c. I'm just going to continue to add stuff onto the bottom of this file. I'm not going to worry too much about the order in which these demos come in because we're going to add quite a few as we go along. Um, but go ahead and paste it in there. And then at this point, what you want to do is you want to take a second to go ahead and build the project because you're going to assume that you're going to be given working code. And so that if you started off with working code and uh, you've pasted in some working code, then ideally your project still should compile. Now, at this point, we've done absolutely nothing. We've included a prototype and we've also uh, included the function itself, but we're not actually running it yet. And so what you want to do now is you want to go to main, and this is where you want to include a call to your function. And so you can go ahead and type out the name of the function uh, manually, or you can just type in a few letters. It, hit control in the space bar. And then that means we'll give you a suggestion as far as which function to call, followed by a semicolon. And at this point, then we are going to be making a call to our arithmetic operators demo. Now, um, since we don't want to also call figure 2.1 or any of the other functions that may be in your main, you want to go ahead and comment those out. So I'm going to go ahead and save it, and I'm going to go ahead and build it. And you'll see that we have a successful build. So whatever we've added here at least appears to work so far. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to go out to the command line. And I would like to CD into my projects directory. Now, at this point, you should have several projects started. You may have more than I do or even less. But for right now, uh, what we want to do is we want to focus on our fundamentals demo. And if I type in DIR, I'll see a list of all of my 
projects that I've been working on. So we're going to go ahead and change into the fundamentals demo. Once again, do a DIR, and you'll see that now we have our fundamentals.c there. Uh, so we know we're in the right spot. And we want to go ahead and change to the distribution folder. And we can, at this point, probably go ahead and do a couple of folders. So there's our debug and our mingw, and type in DIR. And there is our fundamentals demo.exe. Now, if we run this, you should see a table. If you've managed to successfully import the function prototype, uh, the function implementation, and also made a call to our arithmetic operators in main, then you should see the table that I have in my console. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a second now. I'm going to actually go ahead and close out the SNPs file that I gave you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to split my screen between NetBeans and the console. And this might take a little bit of rearrangement on your part. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to get a both up into the view window here so uh, that we can walk through piece by piece what's actually going on in this demonstration. Uh, so to begin with in the code, you should notice on line 79, uh, your line number might be different than mine. And in future demos, this is probably going to be the case. Um, but in the first couple of lines of any function is where you should be declaring then your variables that are going to be scoped uh, with respect to the function. So in other words, in this case, these variables expire once the function terminates. So this, these variables are only good inside of your arithmetic operators function. Um, you'll notice that the way this works in C is that you start off by declaring the variables data type. So int is an integer. Um, these are probably not the greatest names for variables. Um, I wanted to include not only a simple variable name, but also the data type so we can keep track of what we're doing here. So a underscore int was my choice. Once again, perhaps not the best variable name in the world, um, but we'll get better at that as we go along. Uh, likewise, I have declared a variable b underscore int. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm basically allocating the amount of memory required to store an integer. We'll get into the size of different data types in another video. But right now, you can basically say that I'm, I'm, I'm setting aside that memory to be used by the variable a underscore int. And likewise, I'm setting aside that memory for b underscore int. Now, I'm doing the same thing with the other two variables, my a underscore double and b underscore double, with the big difference, of course, being that they are the double data type, double precision. Um, so they, they, would, they would be a different data type for storing different numbers. And specifically, integers aren't going to have decimal places, and whereas a double is going to assume that you're going to be trying to store a value that needs a decimal place. Um, we will go in once again to the size in a different video in the size, the range of data that can be covered, uh, the range of numbers, excuse me, that can be covered within a specific data type. Now, what I'm also doing here is after declaring them, remember that you have essentially garbage in these variables, meaning that it's an unpredictable value. It may be from the last time the application was ran or that last time that that memory was used. So essentially, in that first block of code there where I'm declaring those variables, I have nothing but garbage in those variables. So in other words, you can't trust what's in them. Instead, what we want to do is we want to explicitly then initialize those variables. So we're going to do this in a two-step process. We're first going to declare the memory that is needed for a specific variable. And then we are going to initialize the value stored at that memory or the value of that variable. You can think of it both ways. We would like to get into the habit of thinking in terms of spaces of memory, uh, because that will benefit us much more later on. So now what we do is we essentially just assign the value of 10 to a underscore int, the value of 3 to b underscore int, and then notice now when I'm dealing with doubles, I actually use a decimal point to indicate that I'm actually going to assign a double value to, in this case, a underscore double. If you don't do that, in other words, if you just simply say a underscore double is equal to 10, you will still be storing a double precision value. The only thing that's going to happen is that that value is going to be cast, essentially. And uh, we'll talk a look, uh, take a look at that a little later on as well. Likewise, with b double, uh, we're simply assigning the value of 
3.0. Now, I have this um, warning here. You're more than welcome to go ahead and change this at this point. But basically, the idea is that it's just supposed to be a nice looking table here. And so what I've done here is provided with a nice table name, um, a uh, border for the table, and you can see that represented over here in your console. It's just once again supposed to look nice. Now let's get into the, the heart of this table. And if you'll notice here, I'm throwing a lot at you, a lot of different things, including the use of the printf function. And we've seen it once before, but we really haven't dug into it. And that is the printf function allows for us to print a nice, neat, formatted string. And so one of the things that you will want to take a look at is going to be the Wikibooks documentation on the printf function, particularly if you scroll down after reading some of the history of the printf function. The part that we're going to be the most interested in is going to be this table here that indicates the type of data that can be displayed with a printf function. Now you'll see here, for instance, a D can indicate a signed decimal and an F is going to be a double. Now I'm gonna leave this table for later, but I'm also going to encourage you to go through and read through it so that you briefly know the different uh, formats that we're gonna be interested in. Uh, another one that we're gonna be commonly using is going to be the S and the C and then you will occasionally run into some of the others, particularly the percent character. So once again, bookmark this page, read through it, become familiar with some of the format identifiers that we're going to use. So now with that little tidbit of knowledge, this should probably make a little bit more sense. So this percent %d is essentially saying that I am trying to print an integer. Well, likewise, this percent %d also says that I'm trying to print an integer and this percent %d also an integer. Now, I have three of them listed within this string right here. So in other words, I have three percent Ds, which means I have three things I'm trying to print. We're going to ignore right now this stuff in between. If you'll notice following the comma after the string, after the double quotes, you'll notice here that I have one, two, and then a third value. And I'm grouping that third value with parentheses so that we can emphasize that we're to add those two values together before returning the results. Now, essentially what happens with fprintf is the first placeholder is filled with the first value following the comma. The second placeholder, the second percent %d, is filled with the second value following the comma. And then the third percent %d is filled with the value that is as a result of adding these two values together. Now, the last little piece of information that you need to know here is this backslash n, which basically is the new line. Now, this should hopefully make a little more sense, because if you look over here on the right-hand side, you see that I've taken 10 and I've added three to it, and of course it equals 13. But that didn't just happen with magic. We did the work of adding the two together over here. And on the left-hand side, this is just nothing more than making it look pretty. So effectively, this string does not do the addition. This just is how we're going to display it. Now, continuing on with that theme, you probably can look down and you can see that all we've got here is an exercise of adding subtracting, multiplying, dividing, and then we'll take a look at this one in just a second and see if you can figure out what this one does. Now, with the addition of two integers, or the a int and b int, it's not surprising that an integer and an integer would result in an integer. Well, it's probably also not too surprising that if we took a double and we added it to a double, we would in fact get a double. And notice here that you have a period followed by a bunch of zeros. That is the default length of the double precision value when you simply print it with a percent %f. We'll once again come back to that in just a little bit. Now, this is where things get interesting. When you add an integer to a decimal, what do you get? Well, if you look over here on the right-hand side, I'm actually going to be adding, in this case, an integer to a decimal value or a double precision value rather, and I get a double precision. That is because 
you will essentially end up going with the more precise data type when you're doing an addition or you're doing, in this case, an implicit casting of the value here. So essentially what's happening here is you're adding an integer to a double and you get a double because you don't want to lose the precision associated with the double. Likewise, if you add a, a, a double, excuse me, to an integer, you would also, of course, get a double precision value. It's not too terribly surprising that the same behavior occurs with subtraction. And so this second portion of the table simply deals with subtraction. So if you take a integer and subtract an integer, you get an integer. You take a double, you subtract a double, you get a double. You take an integer and you subtract a double from it, you're going to in fact get a double. Likewise, if you take a double, subtract an integer, you're going to get a double. Continuing on, we're going to look at multiplication. An integer times an integer is going to be an integer. A double times a double is going to be a double. An integer times a double. Well, once again, if we take a look at an integer times a double should give us a double. And then a double times an integer should also give us a double. Continuing on, we're looking at division. A integer divided by an integer is going to give us an integer, which means we're going to have some interesting uh, values returned here, meaning that 10 divided by three is going to be three. Well, we all know from our math classes that 10 divided by three is going to be 3.333 repeating. And the idea here is though that we lose that value when we're doing integer division, we're losing the remainder because with integer division, we only can capture the integer portion of the division. So in this case, 10 divided by three is just simply three. If we do double, so in other words, we take the 10.0 divided by 3.0, we're going to get 3.333, depending on the number of places that we print out right now. We just have the default. Continuing on, we have an integer divided by a double. And in this case, we are once again going to return the value with the higher precision. So, or return the data type. Uh, we're going to look to the data type with the higher precision to determine the return value rather. In this case, a integer divided by a double is going to be a double. And then lastly, a double divided by an integer is also going to be a double. Which brings us to our last operator. And also, more importantly, how do we display it? So, if you've noticed in all the previous examples that if I were to indicate the format of the data that I'm trying to print, I had to use a percent in front of that identifier. So a percent F would indicate a double and a percent D would be an integer. Well, how do I then manage to actually print a percent sign? Well, that's where that last row in that table for the types are. And that is in order to print a percent sign, you simply preface it with the literal percent. And so if you probably want to take an opportunity to take a look at that table a little more in depth and some of the other examples to appreciate how uh, what you're going to see here is essentially an escape character for some of these functions. In this case, though, what I'm doing is I'm taking an integer and I'm getting the remainder of the division by another integer. So in this case, three divided by excuse me, 10 divided by three is going to be three remainder one. And so what the percent operator or the remainder operator results in is going to be the remainder of the division of 10 divided by three. Now, the purpose of these examples are twofold. One is to get you started with using the operators, but also to give you a template by which you can play around a little bit. So I encourage you to go ahead and extend this example, not just simply stop here, but try out some other scenarios, particularly uh, grouping with parentheses so you can convince yourself of the order of operations. Once again, if you've got any questions or comments about this video, don't hesitate to reach out to me, and hopefully you found this useful. Thank you for watching.